Isaiah 51 says, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. God extends to man everything that we need in his gracious offer to come and buy and eat and to drink at this water of life freely. But some, pursuing the wrong things for self and wickedness with no thought of God at all, do not respond. As a result, in their ways, they, it brings them to ruin, and yet they refuse to come to him. So he asks this question, the Lord does, Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? He is the bread of life. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And he came to tell us that. He is the only way we can be fulfilled and satisfied. And he didn't keep that from us, that information. He has made us in this way uh, with part of us to be filled by him, to, uh, for him to abide in us and to reside in us. Some try to put other things in there, though, is the problem. They have other people that become their gods or money that becomes their god or uh, just their uh, ability to have power or prestige in this world, whatever, becomes more important than God. His offer is to come and eat what is good because he knows only he can give what we need and only he can fulfill and give us satisfaction. His promises are good and true. His mercies are new every morning. He wishes that none would perish but that all would come to him. But he doesn't force anyone to come. He gently calls those who are his sheep. Come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, and will, I will give you rest. He tells us what we need to know. The last part of this second verse after his question, he says, Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in abundance. Amen. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen that you may live. Yes. Amen. Amen. question of our focus text this morning is one of what men would say is uh, incredulous or incredulity. That is, you're kidding. <laughs> that, that, that can't be. No, no one would do that, would they? Well, I'm afraid it's true that some do do that. Well, in the world, when we think of buying and selling, which goes on constantly, it, some would say makes the world go round, Only a fool would do such a thing as to spend your money for what you don't really want or what you don't really get, end up with an empty hand, and work or labor for what doesn't satisfy. Well, no, one would, no one would do that, or if they do, when they find out they're immediately on the phone to a lawyer, aren't they? To get a refund. They're filing a complaint. They're calling the television and, new, and radio news people, and they want a microphone. And they want to announce it to everybody. Look, look at what these people did to me. When I gave them my good money, I gave them my good time and resources of energy, and look what, they, look what I got. I got a handful of gravel or sawdust. Well... Gravel and sawdust is useful, isn't it? They didn't get anything <laughs> useful. Now, our primary text, we know, brethren, is both a question and a revelation of godly truth or reality. This is the way it really is, or it brings to mind reality. God poses this question to his people in Isaiah's generation who have drawn back from him. They've receded from his revelation, the revelation of himself that he had granted them. No other people on the face of the earth had this revelation to this extent. 
In fact, hardly anybody had any other kind of revelation. <laughs> you know, old Abimelech, revelation he got was, you're a dead man. That's, a, that's about all he got. <laughs> you're a dead man. That's not very much. Everybody already knows that. It's just a matter of time, and he, you know, before it's fulfilled. But Israel, they, they got a, you know, they got truckloads of revelation about what God loves and treasures and values and about what he hates and despises and abhors, what's obnoxious in God's sight. They got a boatload of it, as they say. They, by, by, by comparison, they knew the Lord by comparison to the rest of the world. Now, they didn't know him by comparison to us. But by comparison to the rest of the world and their generation, they knew the Lord. They knew that God watched over his word to accomplish it for good in those who were chosen of his wisdom, mercy, grace, and goodness. But, and, and they also knew that those who rejected these things, they knew this, that those who rejected his revelation that his wisdom and goodness actually turned against them and became an enemy to them. You don't want to be an enemy of God. Amen. No, no. Amen. You don't want to be on the wrong side when the Lord comes out to battle and pulls out his sword. You don't want to be on the other side of that sword. You want to be behind the Lord, following after him. You don't want to be in front of him because he's coming through and nothing's going to stop him. And nobody on that side of the sword is going to benefit at all. Israel knew these things, and yet they drew back. They drew back. In fact, it got so bad with, with Isaiah's generation that he had to say these words to them. Now, you're familiar with these words. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Another question, huh? What are you doing in my house, God said. Doing those things and acting that way. He was greatly offended. Treading my courts. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. That means it stinks. Now incense was not intended to stink. It was intended to be pleasing. And comforting. A sweet savor. But God says, your incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. That's getting pretty, that's getting pretty harsh. These are harsh words, aren't they? Religious people would be, church people would be offended if the preacher got up and said, I'm sick of you people here. I, I have offended some folk that way. Now, I didn't say that precisely. But I did say, I did say, some of you are here for the wrong reasons. And some of those folks didn't come back. Of course, if the shoe fits, it didn't bother me. Now, it bothered some other people, but it didn't bother me any. They were there for the wrong reasons. It was true. See? So it doesn't take much to offend some folk when it comes to these matters of the reality of what God thinks about some things. So he goes on and says many other things. Uh, I'm weary of bearing them. My, your feasts, your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I am weary of bearing them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes. Put away the evil of your doings before my eyes. Now again, strong language, harsh language from God to his people. Harsh, blunt, a stark warning. This is a warning. He goes on and gives them a warning. There's, there's still a little bit of hope, not very much. You might say a crack in the door. It's not very much. They better rush for it and get their finger in that crack and push it open. Be aggressive to get that door open, the opportunity they have to return again. These people were dead to God in their hearts. They would not respond as he intended. Now, they did respond. You know, a rejection is a response. Yeah. But that's not what God's looking for. As far as what pleases him goes. In fact, in a certain section of Isaiah's record, he uses these words. Words which Jesus 
sighted one time. This people draw near me with their mouth, with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hearts from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. That's what Brother Given was just preaching about. The precepts of men. Brethren, let this not be said of us. Let us rightly reason on the words of our primary text, this question, probing question, that is intended to, to provoke the godly heart to think rightly. God has provided this to engage our hearts. For those of us who are in Christ, what he intends is for us to yield, to yield ourselves to the enlightenment of his spirit, who then will adapt us to God's ways and words and thoughts. Do not, do not dare to come to God's judgment as strangers, unfamiliar with his work and his ways. For such people will hear these words. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now our focus text, Isaiah 55, 2, poses a question that is based upon God's provision to engage him in truth. It's, it's like the Apostle Paul said to those in Athens, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. This is what God intended for these people, to return to him and draw near. We think about men who have uh, the resources to purchase things in the earth, what we need, food, shelter, clothing. God grants us these things in fulfillment of the appetites that he's also granted us. He's made us with these desires. We want to be warm. <laughs> we want to have shelter from the elements. And we want to have food in our bellies. We like the taste of it. <laughs> and, and we want to have what I call fuel. You know, when I'm at the warehouse working, and I begin working at 7.15, and by 9.15, I, I need some fuel. I've probably lifted 1,500 pounds in those two hours, 40 pounds at a time. Climbed up and down the, the uh, racks a couple of times, maybe 15 feet off the floor. Walked across the property three or four times, walked through the warehouse three or four times, which is about a block and a half, in that two hours. And I need something to replenish me. He made us with these needs, which motivate us. You know, when we get thirsty, we want to drink. <laughs> it moves us. Where's, where's my thermos? I need a drink. Where's my mug? I need a drink. It's not on my desk, oh, it's, at the, it's at the other end of the warehouse. There I go. Get a drink. It motivates us to engage our environment and work to supply those needs. You do something. You go find something to eat. A donut, a piece of cake, whatever, somebody, some cookies that somebody brought and put on the counter down front, you know. Those ladies there at ARM, they bring stuff like that all the time. Insects, birds, fish, beasts of the field, daily they forage for these things. Yeah. And they find, you, they usually always find what they need. They work, 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 work. Yeah. Constantly searching. Yeah. You, can look at, you may look out here any moment among the leaves and see a bird foraging or a squirrel foraging yeah. right now. For, for They're hungry. Or they know they're going to be. Especially the squirrel, they're, they're looking for, they'll find something and they'll store it somewhere. Come back and get it later. Amen. The earth contains, even in its cursed conditions, what we need for life, what the, yeah. what the uh, animals need for life in themselves and also to reproduce themselves of their kind. So this concept is set down in the words of our primary text. And the full text is set. So David read part of that, a portion of that. I'm going to read the whole thing, all three verses here. In a commanding exhortation, yeah. 
It's, it's motivational, but it's, it commands us to do something. Rhetorical question, in a sense, but it's to stir the heart. It begins with the word ho. Now that's an old English form of hey. Look at me. I'm talking to you. Ho. You get somebody's attention. Somebody across the creek over, hey, hey. Ho. Everyone that thirsteth. Who's that? Well, that pretty much covers everybody, doesn't it? <laughs> you may not be thirsty right now, but wait 20 minutes, you will be. Yeah. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Ye come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Here's our focus text. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which doth not satisfy. And here's an answer. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. Well, those words just lift your head up, don't they? <laughs> I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Now that's a guarantee and a warranty that you want a piece of, isn't it? <laughs> you know who can't supply that over here in town, even with all their bluster and claims. No merchant can provide sure things. They may pop that box open and, whoa, what's this? Can't put this out on the shelf. Or even after they do, you may get it home and pop the container open and, whoa, look what they sold me. And you're hightailing it back to the store to get a replacement or your money back and give that manager a peace of mind about what he put out on the shelf, see? You can't be sure, can you? Got to tell the folks that opened the boxes there, ARM, you, you, we're never sure what we're going to find in some of these boxes. You might find a plastic statue of Mary or a woman's designer purse <laughs> worth a chunk of money. That happened one time. I called the lady in the store, and she said, Oh, thank you for calling. Will you please send those back to us? About five or six big purses in a box. So you never know what you're going to find. But with the Lord, you know what you're going to find. You, and you will get what he says you're going to get. See? So it would behoove us. It would benefit you. It would be an advantage to you to want what he's going to give. If you get anything else than the good that he promises, it will not be good for you. You will get something from him, but it won't be good. If you're not willing to be content and have an appetite for the good things he gives, he will give something else, but you don't want it. Don't be fooled. You don't want it. Such an exhortation as this, well, this is not routine buying and selling because the prophet tells us that these folks don't have any money. You know, do, do, the, do the merchants market themselves to people who don't have any money? Well, they don't intend to, do they? <laughs> they don't intend to. They want to target their words at people who have resources that they want. They want something from you. They're not, please now, <laughs> they're not just supplying stuff that you want. They want something from you. Now, the Lord wants something, too. Yeah. This is an important principle for us to yes. see. And, and uh, I've been speaking about this in my preaching at work this week. Some of you know that I preach every day at work for a few minutes. The Scripture does tell us that the free gift of God is eternal life. And God does give it freely. It's, it's free, and he gives it freely in the sense of abundance. But he does expect a return. The only sense in which it's free is that we can't purchase it ourselves. We do not have the resources. Yeah. We, don't, we don't have the currency. I mean, I mean it's, like, it's like, you know, going to Moscow and trying to spend a dollar. No, you've got to change it. You've got to change it over to their money. Yeah. So the prophet charges them, buy and eat, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. 
Well, not our money and not our cost. There is a cost. And God supplies it. He does freely and abundantly, but he expects a return. He is looking for something. He always has. He always does in his, uh, in his supply and provision for us. It is for us to have an appetite and for us to, as the prophet says, come. Come, incline your ear. Come, buy wine and milk without money and out, without cost. Come ye, come ye. He's the source. You may go to someone else and they may claim, they may make certain claims. You're going to be disappointed. Yes. Remember the text Brother Given ended with a few minutes ago? You will not be disappointed. Amen. Amen. You will not be. Of course, that's because you have aligned yourself with what God's providing. If someone is hungry for something else, there's a sense in which they will be disappointed by God's offering. But it's because they want something else, see? But where's that something else going to end up? It's going to end up in the fire, if it even makes it to the fire. Most of, most of those other offerings are so corrupt, they won't even make it to the fire. They'll be gone long before the fire comes. You know the fire I'm talking about. <laughs> that last fire. They won't even make it to the fire. <clears throat> what God provides will make it through the fire. It won't even be affected by the fire. It will not be shaken, as the Spirit says. <clears throat> now the word wherefore begins our question. And in itself, it's a question. <laughs> it asks why. Why do you do this? Or for what reason? What, what's the cause for you to spend your money for that which is not bread? Why would you do that? That's the incredulity of this, see? <laughs> what's going on here? That doesn't make any sense. That you're buying something, that you're using your resources, hard-fought resources, uh, hard sought resources, hard obtained resources, and then you're not getting anything for them. That's senseless. You don't benefit from that. It's like junk food. It's what we call it in our generation, isn't it? Junk food. It may taste good, but how long does the taste last? <laughs> Not long. Now the effects of that taste may last a while because it, it, it'll, it'll likely draw you back again. Even, even if it's not bread, it'll likely draw you back again just for that momentary sensation, that temporal sensation of taste. Now these whom Isaiah addresses They've been deceived about this, and many, many in our generation have been deceived in the church. We know they have out there in the world, don't we? Many in the church have been deceived about this. They've been fooled. They're, and, and so their sights are set too low. Yeah. Our sights are set too low. They're set on the flesh. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And when you eat those things, it turns to bitterness in the stomach. Remember the little book that yeah. John ate? It tasted good in the mouth. Now, there was nothing wrong with that book, but the imagery is apt for us. The effect of it, see, the effect of it. Now, eating and drinking are necessary. God made us with these needs and desires. We are what we eat because... As we all know, what you eat becomes literally becomes part of you. What you eat and drink. That hot dog, that piece of fish, it becomes part of you. That salad, that pizza, it becomes part of you. Those noodles, they become part of you. Literally. <laughs> that tea and coffee and milk becomes part of you. Yes. 
That's why this matter is crucial. And that's why the prophet's question is valid for every, every generation. That's right. Amen. The generation that left Egypt, they experienced this. And Moses addressed their children then about this matter. He gave them a summation and drew a conclusion for them. That's the generation that was still alive. Their parents were all gone, except for Joshua and Caleb and Moses. They were the only ones standing there with them as testimony of those who came out of the, of the adults who came out of Egypt. Uh, there were a, a, a fair, likely a fair number who were in their teens, and they're still alive. They're the oldest ones now. They're, they're in their 60s, 70s by now. When Moses speaks these words, you're familiar with them. He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did the fathers know, that he might make thee know, here's the conclusion, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. There's your conclusion. He tells you what this means. That's what you're eating the manna meant. It wasn't for their bellies. It wasn't to sustain them for 40 years. It did do that. It was to supply them what they needed from God for their hearts and minds. To affirm to them that God was what they needed. For you see, that, that manna came from the word of God. It didn't come from any other place, did it? There were no clouds up there that supplied that manna every morning on the ground. No, it didn't rain down out of clouds. Some natural phenomena, that's what the meteorologists would say then, wouldn't they? They didn't have meteorologists back then, but our modern day ones would say that. See, there's a natural explanation for this. <laughs> we're the smart guys, aren't we? We'll tell you what it really means, see. Those folks back there, they were dummies. We're the smart guys. This is what it really means, see. No, there were no clouds. It was the word of God. It was the word of God that provided what they needed. Forty years, six days a week. You, you do a little calculation, figure out how many days that was. That's a lot of days. A lot of days. That he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now you remember our mother there in the garden. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. He put the man whom he had formed out of the ground, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, that is good for food. Tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And then there appeared in the garden another one, a stranger whom they would not seen before. To speak to them about their eating. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Oh, he had its own question, didn't he? How convenient is that? <laughs> it provoked something, didn't it? It did, it did its job. It got her to talking to him. We all know she'd have been better off if she'd just turned and left. But she talked. She replied to his question. She engaged him. It was a big, big mistake, as we call it. Error in judgment. Ignorance, innocence. Innocence is not all it's cracked up to be, is it? You know, we're all, today while we're here, we'll all watch the little ones back here with these big doors. We don't want them sticking their fingers between the doors when they shut. And they don't know that. They don't know what that will do. So innocence is not always cracked up to be if you put your finger in the crack <laughs> and get it pinched. Yeah. 
And the woman saw that the tree was good for food after she was provoked by this conversation, that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree was desired to make one wise. Boy, your mind shoots right to 2 John 2.16, doesn't it? Yeah. Everything that is in the world, yeah. the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. <laughs> she took the fruit thereof and did eat, yeah. and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The irreversible deed is done. They ate. Why do you spend for your money for what is not bread? She stretched forth her hand. She spoke to him and stretched forth her hand. Spent her money. So the appetite is a primary concern and interest here. What are you hungry for? What do you want? What are you going to spend yourself for, give yourself for? Our potential to engage what we need to live and move and have our being. Of course, those are not our words, are they? <laughs> They're the words of the Apostle Paul. In him we live and move and have our being. Not in ourselves, not, not in the stuff that he supplies. It's in him. It's in him. For what are you hungry? The offerings of our land and our generation are multitude. And men fiercely protect their right for their appetites, don't they? You can't tell me what to eat. You can't tell me what to wear, where to go. You can't do it. I've got a right. Our airwaves and whatever means of communicating that is full of that kind of language isn't it and there are those who sell themselves to protect your rights you pay them and they'll protect your rights they'll all fight for you as they say I grow weary of hearing that word in the news reports from the politicians fight 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 they're just hungry they're sitting at the table that's what it is in the exposition of the gospel we learn about our corrupted appetites. The human appetite is corrupt. You want the wrong thing. And it must be replaced. That appetite must be replaced. This is basic to our understanding of what God has done. That appetite must be replaced. It, can't, it cannot be, and we've already mentioned this this morning. Brother Given mentioned it. It was probably mentioned a couple of times last night. It can't be just manipulated. It can't be just trained. It's got to be crucified and replaced with a new appetite. And that's what God provides also. This is what he was doing. Amen. See, this is what God has always been aiming at, is replacing. I'll give you a new heart, is what the prophet Ezekiel said several times, didn't he? A new heart. That's, that's what that is. It's an appetite. When you seek something with your whole heart, you're hungry for it. Let me have it. I'm not going to be denied. I will not accept anything less. See, that's what the hungry one says. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said there in Titus 3, verses 5 through 7, according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That, that goes right to this appetite, a renewing of the Holy Ghost. Underline that which he shed upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs. That goes right to the appetite too, see. The heir wants something. And they position themselves to obtain it. Heirs, according to the hope of eternal life. That also goes right to this appetite. You hope for it. It's motivating you. You got your eye on it. You're, you're, you're extending your hands to get that thing. Renewing airship and hope provided by God in Christ Jesus. He supplies his people with godly hunger and thirst, and he satisfies that hunger and thirst as they long for the pure milk of the word and progress then to the meat provided for the mature. Yeah. See? I don't want a glass of milk for dinner. 
I want something more solid. Now, I may wash it down with some milk. <laughs> I won't refuse the milk. But I want something else with it. Or before it, I should say. But generations later, Jesus would use these words. They've already been mentioned this morning. So Debbie read a section of this text. But here's Jesus, some of his first words of the, the uh, crux of what he said to this crowd who came looking for him the next day. He had fed them. There you go. He had fed them just the day before. And they had freely eaten of what he supplied abundantly until they, until they, they were full, as we say. And they took up even more, 12 baskets more. Amen. Then when they came looking for him, they had this exchange, this, inter, this, this preliminary exchange, and then Jesus got to, he got to the meat, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> when he said these words, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man will, shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So now this controversy starts between him and his audience. The world and the flesh and the aim of our soul offers something that's pleasurable for a season, a short time. Yeah. And many settle for that moment. Yeah. And they even convince themselves. And there are people out there who will convince you, well, you know, that's just all we're going to get here, so just enjoy it. They use words like, enjoy the journey. They make a bigger deal out of making the meal than they do eating it, don't they? They sure do. They make a whole television show out of making the meal, and the last 45 seconds, they take a bite. The actual eating is the last 45 seconds, but they've, got, they've had, you know, 23 or 24 minutes of a 30-minute show making the meal and entertaining you with their patter. Some think the moment's all that there is, and they become content with emptiness and lack and, and a failure yeah. of yeah. earthly things. They resign themselves to, well, they resign themselves to the fleeting taste and the brief satisfaction, they also resign themselves to enter into death, thinking that that's all that there is. Well, goodbye, everybody. And they don't know that there is a hello on the other side of that goodbye, do they? And, the, and of course, then it's too late. Amen. It's irreversible. Then it's irreversible. Yeah, it is. Mm. <clears throat> Like the rich man who enjoyed rich fare while he was in the earth. And he used all of his resources just for that rich fare that quickly passed away until he did. Yeah, then he passed away. And then the opportunity to use his resources in a better way, that opportunity was gone and everything was set. As they say, everything was set in stone then. Yeah. And it could not be changed. God provides that which is good so that your soul can delight itself in fatness. Yeah. But people must be willing to receive that. His goods are, were, are as abundant or more abundant. They're really more abundant than the trees in Eden or the manna on the ground. Jesus addressed this in his words here to this crowd. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he that cometh down from heaven and giveth life into the world. They said in him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. I am the bread of life. You can imagine somebody in the crowd going, did he say that? Did, did I hear that right? I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth, believeth on me shall never thirst. And somebody in the crowd says, I don't see any bread. <laughs> we had bread yesterday. I don't see anything like it now. He continued and restated it. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat the manna in the wilderness and are dead. 
This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread. Which came down from heaven, if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. The bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh. See, he presses the point even harder. They cannot avoid his point. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day. Now that's the table you want to be at on the last day at the wedding supper of the Lamb. You, want, you, you better be at that table. Welcomed. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. Let us then, brethren, unlike this crowd, incline our ear. They, they refused to incline their ear and come to him. They turned and left, didn't they? And again, let me remind you, there was no pleading from Jesus. Wait, let me explain. Yeah. No. Nope. No. They were making their choice. And at that, now they may have changed their minds later, much later. But at this point, this was their decision. And Jesus let it lay, so to speak. He let it set. Now it's God's agenda that drives his purpose forward. His opponents will only be able to, so, so to speak, wipe the dust from their eyes as he goes by and passes them up. They may attempt to raise up whatever they can against the knowledge of God, but God's promise, they shall all know me, it will be fulfilled. His people will be able to assess and obtain the meat that endures to eternal life. They will exercise their uh, faculties, if you want to say it that way, their senses, their spiritual senses. They'll be able to discern good and evil. This is what he intends. They will be able to enter, they will be prepared to enter the world to come. And in that place, they will have access to the tree of life that reappears, as Brother Jason said last night. It, it appears again, doesn't it? that tree of life. For those who have an appropriate appetite. But brethren, now is the day in which we train our appetites. We prepare ourselves to eat. So that it will be said true of us, blessed are they which are called unto the married supper of the Lamb. For these are the true sayings of God. They are invited to the feast. Come now, for all things are ready, as was said in the parable by the king. And we will be able then to respond to the final invitation. Come. The spirit and the bride say come. Yeah. Let him that heareth say come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. God's grace and peace to you, brethren.